We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? And welcome back to a really radio show 130B. Science. If you wish to science an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically <laughs> literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you kill people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. All right. <clears throat> so not everything works in science. Some things get a little bit funky. And I, I decided to, to put on the old beanie, you know, the propeller hat beanie here and, and kind of get wound up a little bit on some, some harder science today. Let your nerd flag fly. That's kind of what's going to gonna happen here. So, I ran across an interesting article, if I can actually find it here. Um, okay. About breaking the second law of thermodynamics. Ooh. And That's sexy. In order to understand what that means, we have to unpack things a bit. And the first thing to unpack is... What the hell is entropy anyway? Unfortunately, kind of important. entropy is, it's been co uh, co-opted by multiple disciplines and it means slightly different things in every discipline. But in layman's terms, entropy is the randomness in a system. Uh, in computer science, randomness, randomness is desirable. We want randomness so that we can have good encryption and things like that. In physics, randomness is unusable in the grand scheme of life the universe and everything entropy is what the universe is headed for ultimately where all coherent systems decay to randomness or lose their energy basically so for our next topic uh entropy is a high energy state that naturally wants to seek a lower energy state because that's easier for it to maintain again you know, think about it from what i've heard in books and everything else it's the general desire of all things to go from order to chaos. Right. Uh, in in hard mathematics, which is kind of what this, this ends up being, it gets fuzzy right around the quantum realm. And guess where this is? It's in the quantum realm. That's where we break the second law of thermodynamics. Um, so the, the article itself was that there would be a loophole in thermodynamics itself it's it's wacky and again it's really hard science so in brief scientists have formulated a mathematical theorem which shows that the second law of thermodynamics may at least have a loophole and the finding may provide a foundation for future discoveries that allow us to power devices remotely this is the kind of thing that uh, tesla was all into um, so this is like quantum entanglement with power transmission? Kind of. Um, <clears throat> there was a physicist, um, uh, Maxwell. Uh, he, <laughs> <laughs> he had theorized. He was also a philosopher of, of, uh, of natural systems and things like that. Uh, it was James Clark Maxwell. Uh, and he had uh, theorized a, uh, a thought experiment called Maxwell's Demon. And in, in two systems, say, say you have two rooms. You have a cold room and you have a hot room. And you have, basically, in those rooms you have gases. So cold gas and hot gas. And you have a doorway in between. In standard thermodynamics, the second law, you would open the door and the hot would mix with the cold and both rooms would eventually come down to a state of equilibrium. In to re, to really basic it down, the Maxwell's demon thought experiment was basically the demon was a bouncer at the door, preventing certain things from happening. And in this new quantum experiment, for certain periods of time, thermodynamics instead of going towards entropy actually goes towards a more energi energistic state. 
which it really shouldn't ever do. <laughs> so it's it's really fascinating and really difficult to actually understand. <laughs> so I've got links. Um, the Maxwell's Demon uh, thing, that's... It's just rabbit trails. It's all just rabbit trails to, to try and figure these things out. So I hope that what I've said there with unpacking it actually makes any sense whatsoever. Um, you guys have, have some physics background. A little, yeah. A little bit. So what what do you think about this? In truth, and I say this not as just some kind of hyperbolic thing, but in the fact that it actually, I mean this in, in truth, the implications of this blow my mind because of how far-reaching it can actually be. And if it can be done on a regular basis and sustained, I mean, we're, we're talking an absolute paradigm shift in how we live, work, and everything seeing how, again, basic technology takes us and changes. I mean, take the early 1900s where you had horse and buggy. And then inside of 40 years, you had vehicles, you had automobiles, planes, and the atomic weapon. Mm -hmm. In 40 years, you went from, I'm taking the horse and buggy to, to the market, which is five miles away, to, hey, honey, let's travel to New York City for the weekend. It, you know, that level, and probably even maybe even beyond that, it's just, the implications are too large for me to even truly comprehend right now. I can get that. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I had to bring this up, and it's like, okay, wait, no, what, what does this mean, you know? And and even that still doesn't doesn't even tell us, it's like, well, okay, that's that's nice, Andy. That's great. But what does that actually mean? Well, if we could... If we could somehow maintain an energy state without pouring more energy into it, then batteries last longer. Physical objects don't decay as fast. This theorem could be very important for fusion. Absolutely. Because if you can <clears throat> if you could somehow, you know, maintain a quantum state that would then kind of hold back entropy a little bit then you have a longer period of time at the nucleus of that of that fusion reaction so that could be that could be stunning that could really be stunning yeah um and uh james clark maxwell clerk clerk maxwell not clark uh that was in 1867 that he came up with this thought experiment so th this has been around for a long time we've known about about entropy and, and how bad it is. Um, now, of course, this is also entropy in closed systems. You know, mm -hmm. in a closed system, you don't lose energy, but there isn't really any such thing as a completely closed system. Like, here on Earth, we're not a closed system. We're constantly getting more energy from the sun. Therefore, we can continue to do things like this. Uh, we are still bleeding it out into the universe, but, you know, we're getting more energy than we're than we're losing that way, so. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, so anybody that that you know gets onto the, uh, the, there's two kinds of people that get into the discussions about the second law of thermodynamics. Huh. There are people that are incredible science nerds that are just geeking out over the prospects of things like this and Maxwell's demon experiment. And then there's people like young Earth creationists that say that, you know, it's it's not possible and there has to be intelligent design in the universe and fine-tuning arguments and blah, 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 blah. That's pretty much where it ends up. And they don't understand, actually, you know, all this yeah. this bit. So let's, let, let, let's, say, let's say those young Earth creationists, those groups don't typically understand how the second law of thermodynamics actually works. Right, because if they understood it, they wouldn't use it as an argument because it doesn't yeah. work because we're not in a closed system. And, yeah. So there's that's usually when you're going to hear this. So should you find yourself in that kind of uh, kind of argument, uh, one, I'm sorry, because they're horrible. Uh, and two, now you have a little bit of uh, <laughs> a little bit more knowledge that you can uh, 
uh, bring to the occasion, however that may be. So also, I, I hope that, uh, you know, entropy itself has kind of been a little illuminated here. Um, I don't really have much more to add uh, to this other than uh, Vincour, one of the, um, uh, Valerie Vincour, uh, one of the authors of, of the study, uh, hopes that this could lead to the creation of seemingly impossible machines like a local quantum perpetual motion machine. Uh, another use that he sees would apply to the principles powering devices remotely. Uh, for, for example, uh, refrigerators would be able to be cooled at another location than where they're powered from. That's trippy. Yeah. Yeah. Your refrigerator, so like your refrigerator is in your kitchen. However, the actual cooling of it takes place three miles down the road. Well, okay, so we're talking cooling now. And power states in cooling... That leads me to room temperature superconductors. Yep. And the faster we get to room temperature superconductors, the faster we become a new type of civilization. Yeah, if we can yeah, ex- find a way to bleed that heat directly into space by completely skipping the Earth's atmosphere, yeah, problem solved. <clears throat> yeah, that's yeah, that's true. That that whole oh yeah, we keep warming up the planet thing. Hmm. Yeah. If we don't explode in the next five years, yeah, <laughs> this stuff could be really cool. Now, in in, in uh, <laughs> was it last week's show uh, where we discussed that they were they had figured out a way to turn CO two directly back into ethanol? Yes, yes uh, I was. saw this. With uh, yeah. with that, that there I heard yet another podcast because that's a big item. So a lot of people were talking about it. Uh, but in between then, now and then. Um, just imagine giant scoops that are just taking in the the CO two out of the atmosphere naturally, not <clears throat> not even from our vehicles where it would be you know just immediately reused, but just sucking it down and just immediately turning it into into fuel. What does that do to nations like Saudi Arabia? Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, you know, the the fact that we're moving away from crude oil as a as a main energy source is doing terrible things to their economy now. Yeah. So. The, the concept that we would move completely away from their main export natural resource. And it's the thing that blows me away is re- like ultra resource rich company countries like them, like uh, Venezuela and such. Yeah. I'm always surprised. Like, okay, they got all this money coming in. Wonderful. You're really, really rich right now. Why aren't you going hi? Let's like diversify. Why isn't Saudi Arabia in the middle of a very flat desert being one of the primary leaders in solar technology it's a great question because they could yeah they've got the money to easily go hi we're building a we're building the bleeding edge solar plant to figure out how to do all this stuff make it the most efficient and oh look we literally have a solar factory out there a solar farm out there which is powering our entire country and the answer is simple laziness why yeah. Why spend the money and the resources and the time developing the infrastructure for the next generation when the current generation is making you uh, boatloads of money? Short, well, again, I, I would easily, again, I would easily look at the history for that. Just you look at every country which has ever had the whole, you know, which is their primary thing is all resource, they're all natural resource. Well, they, it's not, you know, not just all natural. Curse. It's not just all natural resource. It's monoculture resource. They've yeah. only got but the again, one. It's the resource curse, which anybody out there who wants to look that up, you'll learn about this in a heartbeat, probably better than I can explain it here. But that whole, yeah, eventually that's going to go away, or eventually people are going to stop using it as much as they are, because you have stuck yourself at one particular moment, and everything else is, oh, look, entropy. Everything else is still moving on. (laughs) Well, you know, the world is stupid, so... They might be able to export non-GMO crude and, uh, and <laughs> really get that bandwagon back up and running. Artisanal uh, crude oil. Artisanal. Ar- ar- artisanal. Artisanal. <laughs> artisanal uh, organic, which it actually technically would be organic. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is this crude oil gluten-free? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> oh God! Okay, is this open? Lane? Okay, so Saudi Arabia. For, no, if you no, want to no, hire no. us for the low, low price of, uh, I'd say, ten million dollars a year, 
We're willing to be PR free people for you. Absolutely, we we do. Cage free, crude people. That's Can't, what you want. Free range crude. Cruelty free. Free, free range crude. Free range crude. Oh god. Maybe <laughs> I should name that. No, no, no. Free range crude. Hmm. Many dinosaurs died so that you can have oil today. Well, you know that that's also but a misnomer. They have to. It's a misnomer though, because mm-hmm. it's not actually the dinosaurs that we that it turned into oil. It's the vegetation. It's all the vegetative layers that actually compress down into oil. So, you know, it's like olive oil or something. Yeah. But with a yeah. with a with yeah. a hint of tyrannosaur. Mm. But the tyrannosaur provided the yeast that allowed it to ferment into delicious crude. <laughs> ah, there you go, there you go. That... Remember remember there are different grades. That whole light sweet crude. Oh jeez. Okay. I think that might be black and tan crude. <laughs> Wow. Wow. So, um, wait, what's this? Oh, we've got, you've got another, another story in here. Yeah, I threw this one up because one I, I'm surprised you didn't cover. It's a very basic thing. I came across this, I think, a couple days ago. I didn't want to where... go too long. I had, I had other stories. <laughs> we can make this one really quick, though. It's simply uh, Google's leading futurist predicts that humans will start living forever by 2029. Ah, good old Ray's uh, Ray Kurzweil. Of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Funny thing is, he's been actually... Rather accurate with a lot of his predictions, including the time frame. I'm on board with this dude. Yeah, and what he but... says, I mean, I've heard about the things like this for a while going, hey, if you were born before or, you know, by X date, you're going to have no problem because of medical advancements, medical science, you're going to have no problem living for another century beyond what no- people do normally. I'm like, okay, that's cool. What he's saying simply is going, good news, by 2029, medical technology biotechnology will have advanced to the point where it's not like, okay, as long as you were born, you know, no later than, say, or no earlier than, say, 1999 or 2015, you'll now live forever. He's going, no, by 2029, all this technology will be advanced enough to go, you'll just simply add a year to your total life expectancy for every year from that point onward. Mm -hmm. So if you're you know, 60, but you're, a, you know, you still want to keep on living, but you managed to be 60 by 2029. Good news. You're probably not going to die if you don't want to. I estimated just, that we were within going. 30 years of it. He's he's far more aggressive on his timeline than I was. Saying 14 years. Oh, it's 14 a great time years, to be alive as long as we stay alive. As long as, hold on. Come on, as long as we get there. As long as we get there, we're good. Just, just got to stay <laughs> yeah. alive. Stay alive, people. Um, another, another story that I had uh, that, that I decided not to, not to put in, but since we mentioned Google, uh, you know how Google has their artificial intelligence uh, incubator machines? Well, they, they've got, they put three to work, um, uh, like basically A, B, and C. And uh, they wanted A to pass communication to B secretly while C looked on trying to hack their communications. Ooh. Hmm. And nice. It took them 15,000 tries, but they eventually came up with their own encryption algorithms that nobody understands. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's very brute force procedures. There's oh, yeah. nothing pretty yeah. or elegant about it, but brute force works, man. Yeah. Just, again, with AIs and things that can run that fast, just throw it at it enough times, and it can do it, you know, possibly just, millions of times a day. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what kind of thing they put into it, you know, you know, because we have some absolutely brilliant math as far as <clears throat> encryption goes. You know, it is elegant, sublime-looking numbers. Uh, but when, who knows what they came up with it. The thing is, Google doesn't even know what they came up with. Yeah. That's the weird thing. So, eh. well, so wait. <laughs> essentially, we're teaching the AIs to keep secrets. Is this a good thing? Yeah, exactly. It's like where where is this going exactly? As long as they as long as they stay, you know, our benevolent overlords. I'm kind of okay with that. The, the key word here is benevolent. There was something that they were saying about. Um, and that, now that now that <clears throat> we've mentioned it, I, I obviously have to put the link in. Uh, so let me yeah. let me find that. Um, but it, they were at least optimistic that it wasn't going to be too um, too horrible. 
um, something more uh, just innocent, I guess, was, was kind of what they were thinking here. So let's see here. And uh, so that'll be ob uh, object number four. Google's AI create its own form of encryption. And let's see. And it was just two. These are actual neural networks. So the same ones that were creating the, the weird trippy uh, works of art and everything where everything mm -hmm. ended up looking like a dog or, or an arm with a, with a dumbbell or something, you know, just crazy stuff. Um, it was Alice, Bob and Eve uh, where Alice and Bob had to talk to each other and Eve had to look on. Um, of course, the personification of these three neural networks oversimplifies things a little bit because the way that the machine learning works, even the researchers don't know what kind of encryption method Alice devised, so it won't be very useful in any practical applications. In the end, it's just an interesting exercise, but we don't have to worry about the machines talking behind our backs just yet. With open source deep learning tools like Microsoft's Cognitive Toolkit, it might be interesting to see this play out at an even larger scale. And that's when we get Skynet. Either that, or they're just going to deploy this at, like, DEF CON and watch people lose their damn minds. No. No, why? No, they wouldn't do that. They would not. The, DEF CON is still running on, like, five and a quarter inch floppies. That would still be an you amazing know? thing to see if he could, um, you know, seeing the capabilities of human hackers trying to go head to head against AI. Ooh. And either Ooh. defending a server, hacking a server, everything and just go go and just see what happens. So instead of having just an, an Alice Bob and Eve have an Alice Bob and Eddie and Eve. And Eddie's just the guy, you know, sitting in his terminal just trying to pound it out. Okay, the uh, Alice Bob and Eve in one room, Eddie Bob, Danielle, all those in yeah. the other room, and they're all both trying to hit the server. Whoever gets in first. Yeah, my money's on the AI. Pretty much every time. Yeah. Yeah. There's be they're just better at crunching pure math than we are. and They don't get tired. Math. They don't make mistakes. They don't miss things. They come up with a plan and brute force their way through. They don't make uncertain mistakes. They make mistakes, but Oh they, yeah, they yeah. I should. They don't make simple typo mistakes. Yeah, that 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 would be the truth. That would be the truth. Okay, that concludes science.